Hi there, I'm Dr. Victoria Mattingly, and this is Better Humans at Work. In this week's episode, I'm joined by Sir Therese Grice. Sir Therese is a fellow organizational psychologist like myself, meaning that she's trained in how to use data and science to improve the human experience at work. Sir Therese has deep expertise in helping complex global organizations interpret data and create action plans that drive meaningful change. She writes and presents frequently on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and is passionate about helping clients build cultures focused on anti-racism and allyship. Since recording this episode, Sir Therese actually joined us here at Mattingly Solutions to help me co-lead the company in her role as Chief Consulting Officer. We're so thrilled to have her bring her deep expertise and also lived experience into the work that we do as diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioners. Without further ado, here's my episode of Better Humans at Work with Sir Therese Grice. Hi, Sir Therese. How are you today? Victoria, doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm so thrilled to have you on Better Humans at Work. Uh, you and I have had the pleasure of having a number of conversations about allyship and diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'm just so excited to bring all that good content to our broader audience. Yes, excited to be here. I'm so happy to have you. Now, you and I met through an organization called Blacks in IO. Uh, what is Blacks in IO? And assume a lot of people on this uh, watching this don't know what IO is. So, <laughs> yes, that is a great question and good call out on the IO piece. So, Blacks in IO, it stands for Blacks in Industrial Organizational Psychology, and we're a professional networking and learning nonprofit. Uh, for Black IO psychologists, practitioners, and students, and also allies. Um, our mission is to uplift Black voices and experiences within the industrial organizational psychology industry through continued education, mentorship, networking, and awareness building. Um, speaking of awareness building, for those of you who aren't aware, um, industrial organizational psychology, I like to just say business psych. That's usually an easy thing to grasp. Um, we, we help uh, people in the workplace. So happy, happy to be here for Better Humans at Work because that's, that's what we do. <laughs> yes, and I, I am a fellow industrial organizational psychologist. I, I took the industrial part off and I'm describing who I am. I feel, like, I feel like no career should take 10 syllables to say. So I just got rid of the whole first half. That's what Adam Grant does. I feel like he's the most famous IO psychologist in our field. So mm -hmm. like, it works for him, it works for me. But thank you for sharing that with our audience because I feel like that's such a huge disadvantage. You know, whenever I explain to people what we do, they're always like, oh my gosh, come to our organization. We yes. need you, you know, but we, we need some marketing help in, in our field. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Our biggest thing with IOs is making sure people know who we are. It's so we're a thing, we're a thing. <laughs> and we're helpful. Everyone should have us. <laughs> but, but getting a little more narrow. So it's IO psychology, Blacks and IO, right? So you are the business development and, and partnership chair. What does that entail? And like, what is Blacks and IO all about? Yes. Yeah, so let me just tell you a little bit about their history even. So it began in DC. It was founded by um, our two founders, two strong Black women, um, uh, Macy Cheeks and Siobhan Holman. So it started as a local group. They realized that they weren't seeing a lot of people who looked like them in our industry. Uh, when they'd go to other conferences and events, and they wanted a place where they could bond with people like them. So they created this local group in the DC area, and um, that went for a few months starting in 2019, and then COVID hit 2020. So everything went virtual that they were putting on, and that's when their membership exploded. So I know right now, on our email listserv, we have over a thousand people um, in our, right. So it was insane, exploded. Um, so me, I um, attended my first event probably in like May or so of 2020. And then I started in this role in July over the summer. So over the course um, of my membership, that's where we decided, you know, since our reach expanded, we would then expand that as well. And we decided we were going to go all in. We applied to be an official nonprofit. So that's done. Um, and as the business development and partnership committee chair, um, I've been helping create our membership model, getting our job board set up, um, developing an IO graduate program directory. Uh, and also currently, thanks to our various partners, including Mattingly Solutions, um, we are just about to release a number of scholarships as well for our graduate student members. So 
lots of exciting initiatives over here. Um, and yeah, ex excited to have more people know about it and take part. Yeah, speaking of which, how could those audience members out there who are interested in either getting involved in Black and or supporting Black and IO, how can we get involved? Yeah, that's a great question. So we host events that are open to the public. So definitely, you know, visit our website, sign up for our newsletter on blacksandiopsych.com um, to stay up to date on our activities. But we also have additional programming available to members. You can sign up um, to be an official member. And we, and just wanted to note, again, you do not have to be black to be a member. We love having allies in there as well. So anyone's welcome to join. Um, you can also volunteer on one of the committees, like I mentioned, and lastly, for organizations, if you are looking, you know, to branch out and support um, minority organizations, we're always looking for sp sponsors and partners, either for specific events that we can host, or like I said, we have scholarships and things we offer as well. Um, we'd be happy to set something up. Awesome. Thank you for that. And yeah. you and I met through Blacks and IO because I, I am a ally member of Blacks and IO. Whenever I found that the group existed, I immediately reached out to Siobhan and Macy and said, how do I get involved? How do I help y'all? How do I amplify your message? I love what you're doing. Uh, and so you and I were in a, um, a webinar all about allyship and allyship, not just for Blacks and IO as an organization, but allyship for uh, people of color in the workplace, allyship, you know, as, as IO psychologists. And um, so how does, aside from putting on the webinar, and we'll include the link for that in the comments if you want to check that out, um, mm -hmm. but how does Black Snail leverage allies in the work that they do? Yes, great question. Um, so as you know, the best way to make progress is through that partnership. Um, so we, and we would not be here today without uh, the help of our allies and partners. And this has happened in a few different forms. So one is like you mentioned, we partner with different allies to get those events out there. We wanna make sure we're getting things out there that are useful to the IO community, but also to non-IOs who are just looking for information in this space. And we have the knowledge to be able to help them. Um, so that's one way, partnering with them to get materials out to our members. Um, and then another form is monetary. So like I mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, so we do rely on donations to function and our allies have been really generous in this respect. Um, and we really appreciate the support that we've had happen there. Uh, and then the, the job board is another really great place because we're trying to um, give more opportunities and make sure that uh, black IOs are being um, promoted in the, in, in the industry. So having our partners go and list, you know, hey, here are the opportunities that we have. That way, you know, it's useful for our members because it's something they can benefit from, but it's really useful to our allies as well because it's a way for them to be able to get more diverse candidates into their selection pools. So it's, it's something that, sure, it benefits us, but it's been great to benefit and, you know, that's a true partnership. It's not one-sided. We're working together to help each other. So it's been really great. Love it. You know, in the, in the old excuse in the diversity, equity, inclusion space is like, well, we just don't have a diverse pipeline or, you know, people of color just aren't applying. It's like, no, like, what are you doing to go out and partner with Find organizations them. like Blacks and IO? And, and there's, I'm sure, similar organizations in different industries. It doesn't have to always be IO psychologists, even though, of course, I'm biased. The more IO <laughs> can be hired in this world, the better, in my opinion. Um, but I know for myself, when I see people post jobs, you know, I always try to share it with, with the Black Side IO network. I've done some coaching with some of the members and helping them on their job search. So, I mean, there's so much work and I feel like there's a lot of pushback with allyship nowadays. And like, I, I'm sure you've heard of like performative allyship, right? And it's, it's this phenomenon where people are saying they're an ally, but they're not actually doing any of the work of allies. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really dangerous because we're shutting people down. Whereas it might not be a big deal to us watching from the outside of someone like posting something on social media, that might be rocking that person's world. And they might be offending their friends and family members. They might be, you know, dealing with their own backlash in their own silo because of that. And then we're yelling at them for being performative, right? And so like, like the performative, like I feel like the energy we're spending on calling out performative allyship, we were instead spending it on actions and collaborations and partnerships, like how you said. And so, so Trish just gave everyone out there trying not to be a performative ally, like 10 different ways to be a true ally to Black Snow, and you just heard the impact it's going to have. So 
put your money where your mouth is, put, put your energy and your actions where your intentions lie and, and take those examples. But I want to talk more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, as we like to call it, and the work that you do. Um, so can we talk a little bit about like how you think DEI practitioners and champions like ourselves or those who want to do more with DEI in their organizations, how can they better use allyship to advance DEI efforts? Yes, so I'm going to sound like a broken record on this. Um, oftentimes, it feels like allyship is it's taught as a one off thing, right? So you go into an organization and they're like, okay, we're going to do our allyship training, they'll bring in someone wonderful like you. And then they're like, all right, we did that. Check that off yes, the list. The box. We are done. And then they just move on. Um, and while knowledge is important and it's great, and we do need to have those conversations so people can learn what it truly means to be an ally, you know, and how to move past performative allyship, that's important. But the the key piece is the action, you know, following through with that. Um, and so what I what I like to promote is the same way organizations make goals related to performance or you know how are we driving strategy. Uh, DEI practitioners can make goals tied to allyship as well, encouraging allies to actually put in the work and reward them and their partners for success. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes when we're in the allyship space, there's so much focus on what can the ally do, are they following through, how can we push them, but it's not a one-way street, right? It is that partnership. So it's important to make sure that we are also rewarding the partners. If we're going to tie it to, you know, goals and things like that, we have to make sure that they're, they're getting compensated for all of that work, especially because there's the addition of the emotional labor on the partner side. Sorry. And so, and so yeah. just to clarify, um, you know, I love you using the term partner because did, I mean, did you know, Sir Therese, that the term allyship, the word allyship is not in the Webster dictionary, that if you type it in word, it comes up as a spelling error, like, yes. yeah, that right. that's right. me name. bonkers, yeah, I, I really, there's, there's a, a, a friend and colleague of mine who does a lot of allyship work too, we want to like go after Webster and get this fish in the dictionary. Let's make a but, campaign. Yeah, an allyship campaign. <laughs> but We're on it. But the, having this this depth, this clear definition and terminology is so important. How are we going to do this work if we can't even like define it? So I love how you're using the terms ally and partner because the way that we talk about allyship is about this ongoing relationship, this partnership between an ally and a partnership between two people working together. Because that's where it's, it's having that ongoing relationship. That's where allies. And make sure that they're doing the right actions and things. I imagine if I just came in and started trying to serve Blacks and I.O. in ways that was not helpful to the organization. Let, let me let mm -hmm. me build you a new website. Let me give you a, a, a gathering space. Or like like no, like chill out, ally. Like pay, just <laughs> listen to what we need. Right. So you need this relationship between an ally and a partner to be able to make sure we're doing that right work together. And something else mm -hmm. you said about that check the box. Like I'm, I'm optimistic that these check the box days, diversity, equity, inclusion are gonna be behind us, you know, seeing more chief diversity officers, seeing more, you know, long-term strategies, DEI embedded throughout the fabric of the organization. These check the box days are quickly coming behind us and allyship is cannot be a check the box and it, and it can't be a mandatory thing either and you need to have a certain level of of passion and you have to you have a certain mindset and this work is not easy and it's i love what you said about making sure we're compensating rewarding recognizing both the allies and the partners i remember when i was working with a fortune 10 company helping them build out their global uh inclusion strategy right because they just mm -hmm. completely crushed their diversity goals and they realized oh no we didn't bring inclusion along with it we're losing all these great people we got hired and we need to bring on inclusion so they had a global inclusion strategy we had an allyship program to do that and i kept pushing them i said the measure of success should not be coming from the allies. It should be coming from those who have been served by allies, have the, have the, um, the data we're collecting, there be stories and examples from those who are benefiting from the work of allies, and then everyone benefits from that. I don't care if you think you're the best ally in the world. What I care is the person you're serving thinks you're the best ally in the world. So I just, I love yeah. that point. I love and, that point you made. Yeah, I'm I going to what you were saying. I love that you brought in measurement because uh, especially, you know, with my work at OV, 
that that's something I'm very passionate about. And it also ties to what you were saying about the enthusiasm of an ally, right? You're very enthusiastic. You're excited to help you come in and you just, a lot of organizations make this mistake. They start implementing changes thinking they're doing the right thing, but they don't even know where their issues are. So my, my advice always when someone's trying to make progress in this space is to first measure, measure your organization, find out where are your pain points and then go through and you can actually start implementing those programs. And one of that might be around, you know, allyship and your um, culture for inclusion. And the great thing about, you know, like how I mentioned the tying it in and the rewarding is it helps make that a part of your culture. It's now ingrained. It's not one person driving this, not just your chief person. No, everyone is going to be held accountable because this is what we expect in our organization. And then again, back to that measurement, you have to, like, like you were saying, I love that. You have to come back again later measure it and it's important to look at that by uh by segment as well you know by by area so making sure if your focus was to help your black employees are they actually happier <laughs> and that could be in a survey but it could also be focus groups mm -hmm. having actual conversations and saying hey you know we started this erg or we we changed these policies here have you seen improvement are you feeling like you belong are you feeling included T talk to us about it what else can we do how can we continue to make progress um, because that's another thing that people forget as well. Even if they do these first couple of steps and they think they're done, there's, there is never an ending point in these conversations. This is a continuous journey. Um, if, if you think of where, you know, years ago, it wasn't even called d &I, right? Like, oh, it took a while to get to diversity and now we finally have inclusion and, you know, you go to some places, you'll even get the DEIB, they'll add in belonging and mm -hmm. there's, there's all these ways it changes and grows and there's also uh, the demographics are also, you know, we're learning and changing in some space. Again, if we think of gender identity, that's not something that was discussed years ago and now it exists. Um, accessibility, that's one I feel like people often just forget in, in general, you know? So you, you're, you're never gonna be able to stop these conversations around diversity and inclusion. So it's important to have that ingrained in your cult, company culture. Uh, something I love that you pointed out was that allyship isn't this just like black or white or, or male or female or, you know, one or the other type of deal. And I actually have, have a video about allyship not being black or white that I'll include in the comments below. But, um, but can you talk a little bit about intersectionality and, and how you, you leverage intersectionality in your work and in, in the DEI work that you do? And, and also with this measurement approach, I think that was really clever talking about the different slices and how does intersectionality fit into that and and uh working definition for intersectionality um just for our audience out there like how how would you describe it in like layman's terms that was a lot so let's unpack it all yes <laughs> <laughs> lots we're so excited so with intersectionality that is getting at how do the different parts of your demographic um Inter inter interact, you know, and so we we all have different ways we define ourselves. So just for a case example here, I'll talk about myself. Um, I'm black, right? So that is a minority or new favorite term. Going to throw that out there. Global majority, love it. Um, love so that. isn't that we fantastic? That. Because we're not a minority. We're part of the global majority. So um, I, I right. So I'm black in that space. I'm also a woman. Um, so that is another place where, you know, I tend to be on the partner side. However, I am a cis woman, you know, a cis straight woman. So um, when it comes to the LGBTQIA plus community, I would be looked at as an ally the way I support them. Um, and then if you combine all of that, the intersectionality pieces, not how do I exp experience the world as being black or a woman or straight. It is how do I experience and navigate the world as a straight black woman. So that's what that's what we're thinking about when we talk about intersectionality and the when it comes to, to allyship, something that's interesting here is uh, allies, a lot of times will look at themselves as just a one piece, you know, they're just like, oh, yeah, I am white and I'm going to help these black people or, you know, and and partners often can fall into that trap as well. They're like, you know, I'm black. I need some help. What, what are you going to do for me? And so when I'm in this space, I like to remind people that you you're not just one or the other you can be an ally and a partner at the same time and not only can you but sh you should <laughs> that's it's important where it's not worth it to just sit there and ask for people to help you um, if you have the capacity to help others 
it's definitely important for us to be giving back. Um, but then, you know, also it is okay to ask for help as a partner and reminding people that, you know, while you may be benefiting in some ways, it's okay if you realize, man, you know, like I could, I could use a little assistance here and just leaning on each other. And it also helps with that partnership piece. Um, and the biggest thing when it comes to intersectionality is if something that's being done in an organization to improve life for say, you know, your black employees, what's to say that can also help your women, you know, that that's the key is the things we're doing to make an environment more inclusive is not just for those underserved communities. It's something that will benefit everyone. So while again, as an ally, you're thinking I'm doing this for my partner or for those underrepresented people, in the end, it's not like it's hurting you. It's not taking anything away from you. It is something that is gonna benefit everyone there. So that's, I'll get off my intersectionality soapbox now, but um, yeah, it's, I'm really passionate about how it all, it's all for everyone, you know, and we can all play a role in that. Yes, we all benefit from having more inclusive organizations. And that's something I really do try to help my clients see. And then, and not the ones I work with directly, because I'm working with like chief diversity officers and those leading these efforts. So they already have that mindset, but it's helping them help those in the company that don't quite understand yet and seeing like, well, where do I fit into this? Like, I'm, I'm not a person of color. I'm not a woman. I'm not, I'm not LGBTQ. Like, how do I fit into this? Because an inclusive organization is going to allow you to be, bring your best self to work every day, the person that you choose to be at work every day. It's going to result in more human-centric policies and practices and procedures. Like imagine like less micromanagement, more empowerment, more transparency, more communication, more clarity for career pathing. Like all of these are benefits. We think DE and I, it's like, oh, well, I, it's women and women and minorities. It's like, no, like we are all benefiting. I always say that you shouldn't, exactly. any company that has people in it should have a DEI strategy. Like, like that's how embedded and entrenched these two areas are. And something I thought of when you were sharing about the fluidity of allyship, Sertrice, and how, you know, even in the same conversation, you and I, you and I, even in our conversations have flipped ally partner ally but it's like we're, we're just we're just we're just partners and, and, and supporters of one another but i i thought of that that phrase you know hurt people hurt people and in the way you were talking about allyship it made me think of like helped people help people oh i love that people serve people right and so like it's this positive feedback loop and i feel like what we've all gone through the last year the last all of our lives in some cases, depending on what we're talking about here, but like there's a lot of negativity being regenerated and recirculated, especially on social media. And it's really, there's a lot of ugliness going on in the world right now, but mm -hmm. how do you power app that with, with allyship, with helping others, with serving others? And, and why do we do it? Because it comes back around. Yes. Oh. Yes. It's I, one other thing that I've seen recently that's been really interesting and exciting is um, the new social media app Clubhouse, yes. right? Yes. Um, and so I've been on there some, a lot of people are on it. And one of the things I've enjoyed seeing is how that, that support there. Um, and granted, everything has, you know, their ups and downs and there are some pieces, but in, in the conversations I've been in, they've largely been around DE&I and people are there giving each other ideas, giving each other support. They're connecting. They're like, oh, I need help with this, but I can help you with this. Or I know this person, let me connect you. And so it, it's like a prime example of, you know, how we can do that in the world. But that's something that can happen in an organization too. There's nothing to say we can't be doing this in, in the workplace. I think um, traditionally we've been taught not to discuss certain personal topics mm -hmm. at work. But something that, again, like you being positive, I, I'm hopeful that that's changing now. And we realize that while, yes, there's something about being professional and it is a workplace, I'm still a person yeah. and I am, I am in that workplace. And so if I'm there, it is important and it's something that we need to talk about, you know, and it plays a role in how I am navigating this space. So we can't just cut it off and say, no, it's inappropriate to talk about X, Y, and Z at work. Well it's I'm here and I'm at work so it's work related <laughs> yeah yeah and, and and you know even just with what's happened with COVID and everything being so screeching halt we're now all remote workers now if you're in a white collar industry and so if, if you work 
are bringing yourself into my life, you better be okay those times where I can bring my life into work and it makes me a better employee as a result. You know, I think about, I used to, so I'm a singer and I used to sing under my maiden name because I was like terrified of like my professional world finding out that I sang and like, what would they think? They won't take me seriously. I'm already like a youngish looking woman. Like, and I don't want to add another thing to not be taken seriously. But I was like, no, screw that. Me being a performer makes me a better presenter, facilitator. I, I pay attention to my audience experience, which makes for better, you know, events and all like, I am a better employee and a leader and, and a business person because I am a performer. And so like having exactly. that aha and how can we bring more of that into the workplace? I just, yeah, I love it. Okay. So just to, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> just to wrap up, Sir Tree. So we've talked about E and I, we've talked a lot about allyship. What would, what would three recommendations be for our viewers out there um, who want to be, who want to leverage allyship, who want to be better allies or work with allies, using that as a tool in their DEI toolbox? What would be three recommendations you have? Yes. So for one piece is moving beyond the learning and self-growth phase into actual action. So something we saw a lot over 2020, people are, they were putting in the work and they're willing, but now it's like, okay, now, you know, so follow through, don't keep reading books. That only does but so much. <laughs> now, what can you do? Attend that e e ERG event, reach out to a partner and ask them, you know, what are your professional goals and how can I support you get there? you know, offering that. Um, and then relatedly, if you are a DEI practitioner or champion in an organization, my biggest action for you is to model the behavior you want to see in your employees mm -hmm. and your colleagues. Um, so one specific example here that I'm passionate about, um, which is, you know, definitely different than what people have been taught in the past is calling out inappropriate behaviors when you see them happen. Don't wait and go behind closed doors and have a conversation with that person. And this, I say this because of two reasons. One, this shows your partner that you support them, right? Because it's right there. It's not secretive. You're just like, nope, I like we're shutting this down. And so that'll strengthen that relationship. But it also helps encourage that inclusive culture that we talked about. So that is showing, you know, these behaviors aren't accepted. We're not going to joke about it. We're not going to, you know, brush it under the rug. It's just, nope, cut and dry and then move on. So mo model those behaviors you want seen. And then lastly, if you are already focused on allyship, I encourage you, like I said, to go in and measure, whether that's mm -hmm. um, measuring, you know, what action do you need to take next and where your issues are. Um, but like I said, if you're already doing it, remembering to measure the impact, have a survey, have a focus group check in with your underrepresented communities and say, are we doing it right? Or have we missed the mark? Because if you just keep going, doing what you, you know, assume you need to do, it's still really performative. It's not true transaction or transformational uh, efforts that you're putting in. That's amazing. So just to quickly recap, uh, turn that learning into action, right? So this, the education part is important, but what's next? And now like education is 2020. Action 2021, I love that. Uh, be a role model. So, uh, so Teresa and I are both psychologists. We know social learning is so powerful. We learn so well by watching how others do. So be that role model and show others what, it's, what it means to be an ally and be an inclusive leader at your organization. Uh, and then finally, the third one is measurement, my favorite one. So everything I do with my company, Maddie Solutions, is all about how can we help you create a data-driven DEI strategy? How, how can we help you make decisions that are based on what is happening at the employee and leader level and using that data to drive everything you do when it comes to DEI. So as a fellow IO psychologist, DEI person, measurement person, Sertrice, I'm so thrilled that you spent some time with us today and sharing your wisdom and energy and insights with our audience. Thank you for being here and thank you for helping us become better humans at work. Yes, you're very welcome. I love being here and hope to come back sometime. Yes, anytime, anytime.